Hi, I'm Erin Lundy. And I'm Madeline Walden, and this is Aquarium, Aquarium of the Pacific, a podcast brought to you by Aquarium of the Pacific, Southern California's largest aquarium. Join us as we learn alongside the experts in animal care, conservation, and more. Welcome back to Aquarium of the Pacific. I'm Madeline Walden, the Aquarium's Digital Content and Community Manager. And I'm Erin Lundy, Conservation Coordinator for Mammals and Birds and Animal Care Specialist, especially with frogs. Especially (laughs) specialist, which is the theme of our podcast today. Today we're going to talk about the mountain yellow-legged frog, and I am so honored to have an incredible guest today. Her name is Erin Lundy, and she's also my (laughs) podcast host, and she's sitting right next to me. So unfortunately, I will not be asking any questions, I hope. (laughs) You might be asking yourself. I hope you know the answers to my questions. Some existential questions. What is a frog? A frog is an amphibian. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying you have to ask yourself oh, that oh, every I'm sorry, day. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, what is a frog? A frog is an amphibian. I also told Madeline to stop me if I ever get on a frog tangent that goes too deep. <laughs> if I go into the frog hole, she will pull me back out. No, I think you're great about communicating. You know, I'm I'm not a science person. I don't have a background in science. I just have a background in oh, Aquarium of the Pacific. This is awkward. This is awkward. <laughs> I didn't know So that. whenever you, you're just so great about communicating in a way that's digestible, but mm. also shows your passion for, especially this project that you work so hard on. So I'm just really excited to hear it in depth and to learn along with our audience <laughs> to learn. To learn about our mountain yellow-legged frogs. Mountain yellow-legged frogs. Rana Muscosa. Mm-hmm. But this is also our last episode of the season. This is our 10th episode so of our loved. podcast. It's not over. Don't worry. We'll be back. No, it's been it's been a really great season and we've had actually a lot of different guests on and I think that we've learned about both the animal care side of things from a lot of different keepers. Mm-hmm. If I had to choose what my favorite fact I learned this season mm. was, what would yours be? We've learned a lot. We've learned so much. Um, I don't know. I think just my favorite fact, and this isn't necessarily a fact, it's been watching you learn the thing because well, I'm learning too but you're so visual with your, you're like literally like eyes open like need to take a breath like need to exit the room Am for a I moment okay? you're like ah, they do what <laughs> sea stars start off as two diamonds and what are you talking about why is there a 600 pound octopus I still don't know the answer <laughs> and uh, I have talked to a couple of our guests and you know people around the aquarium who've given me feedback and they're are routinely surprised at how much we don't know mm-hmm. and I think it's a really salient point that, like, people know a lot about the projects that they're particularly involved in, but Mm -hmm. it is difficult to know in-depth information about every species that we house Mm -hmm. because we have so many. We have so many. I mean, we have 12,000 animals here, and we have specialists in every single field and every single, you know, kind of group of that. But something that is part of their day-to-day is mind-blowing for someone else to hear. Specifically me. Specifically you, Erin. <laughs> exactly. So I think that's what's been so cool about the podcast is kind of just tricking our uh, colleagues into talking about all the amazing stuff that they're doing. It's been a trick. Though. It's been a trick. <laughs> they didn't know ruse. they were being recorded. No, they didn't. <laughs> I think that's like a, a violation. I don't think we can do that. We oh. probably need to... <laughs> I all the episodes that we've had so far. <laughs> no, I think my favorite fact, aside from the 600-pound mm-hmm. octopus, that I don't know if it's my favorite or the, just the most terrifying. <laughs> the scariest fact. I love that sea turtles' fat is green from mm-hmm. all the green things that they mm-hmm. eat. And I really wonder what color my fat is based off of all Let, And that's what we're going to find out today. <laughs> Today's episode is about dissecting Erin <laughs> and determining what she eats the most of. Um, that and then also that the octopus have nine brains Mm -hmm. that's a lot donut shaped it's a lot of brains Mm -hmm. there's been a lot i've really liked getting sort of an inside look also josh just like totally roasting us on our own podcast. yeah that was great (laughs) it's one of my favorite things if you guys haven't listened to the jelly episode josh is just like he has the driest humor but he is such a good human too Mm -hmm. and he's so smart about all the jellies that even listening to that episode back was amazing for me. And I felt like I was learning again because it's so complicated that I couldn't absorb it yeah, all Yeah, that's part of it too is going back and editing everything. I learned so much all over again or it's something I missed. <laughs> I'm like, I wish I would have asked about that more. Like, that's fascinating. So we're definitely going to have um, new people on next season. But let us know what your favorite episodes are. Let us know who your favorite um, speakers were. And we'd love to invite them back on to talk about, no. you know, con- no. one, only. one and done. <laughs> that's it. That's all you get. No, but I feel like, you know, we're so lucky, too, that our specialists that we've had on are specialists in other things, yeah. even. So I am looking forward to the future of this podcast yeah. alongside you. And science education from people who are doing the work mm-hmm. is, like, 
the exact niche that I am so interested it's in. It's so valuable. <laughs> it's been a good time. <laughs> this has been one of the most fun experiences of things that I've done here because I get to learn so much mm-hmm. about everything that's happening. And today I get to teach. Today you get to teach. So I'm going to let Erin kind of run with this episode and just kind of interject in between. I didn't ask Instagram questions. Shoot. <laughs> We have that. no Instagram, have no Instagram questions. questions. So I will I will play the role as Instagram today, which is pretend. what I typically do. Cool. Well, I'm so excited to get into this project and to hear more about it. Um, I guess I'm just going to pretend like I know nothing, which is pretty close to the truth. <laughs> of only Most about of the time, frogs, specifically. Only about this specific mountain yellow-legged and frog project. I actually project. know a lot about it because we're friends. And I know. I tell you about it. We're friends? But, You're oh. admitting that? Scratch that. Scratch that Scratch from the that. record. <laughs> um, cool. Well, let's get into the episode. Ba da ba ba da 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 da. Boom. Hi, Erin. Thank you so much for being our guest on Aquarium of the Pacific today. Hi, Erin. It's so nice to be me <laughs> on Aquarium of the. It's very jarring because I'm so used to interviewing someone yeah, and having someone to like to pester. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. And now <laughs> I can't. Pe- I'm being pestered You're pestering in yourself. a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I have just gotten used to learning and not. Mm-hmm. Telling. <laughs> it's not telling anyone. <laughs> but I want to talk to you guys a little bit about a project that has really been sort of the defining project of my career. Um, I, for a little background on me, started here at the aquarium of five and a half years ago. Wow. Mm-hmm. Five and a half years ago. And I was hired on because of my experience with marine mammals and penguins. And obviously, frogs are neither of those things. <laughs> it's an interesting journey from marine mammals and penguins to yeah. frogs. Very... Um, not necessarily polar opposites, but pretty close. I just like things that sometimes are in water and are sometimes <laughs> on land. <laughs> That's true. Penguins can be very amphibian-like in that way. Yeah, Same with so marine mammals. Marine mammals. So it works out. They just um, can't breathe down there. Maybe they could try harder, maybe they could though, because frogs can. And honestly, that's really what sold me mm-hmm. on them, mm-hmm. is their ability to absorb oxygen through their skin. Um, but, yeah, I got hired on to take care of totally different species, and... Similar, I think it was Brooke that was saying that no one really has a linear career path when it comes to working with animals. Mm -hmm. And I think that five years ago, if you told me that I would be heavily involved (laughs) with frogs, I would be very confused as to how I got there. But I started helping to cover some of our amphibian gallery and helping to just like provide coverage on the weekends. And as I kind of grew more and more in that role... And we also kind of concurrently were developing a partnership with USGS and some other institutions that were... What's USGS? U.S. Geological Survey. So that is a federal agency, and they are actually who holds the permit for Mm -hmm. our Mountain Yellow-Legged Frog Project. Thank you. Um, (laughs) So as we sort of developed these relationships and started to think about our prospective involvement in this project... um, I sort of became one of the people who had the relevant experience. And it was actually me and one of my coworkers who no longer works here, unfortunately, but it now works for the World Wildlife Care Network, which mm-hmm. is really cool. And so she gets pictures of the frogs <laughs> almost <laughs> daily. Sorry, Frankie. <laughs> Shout out to Frankie. Shout out to Frankie, who was um, sort of my partner in the project's inception. Mm-hmm. But she and I worked really hard to make that project what it is. And... Now I'm hopeful that we can teach more people what a mountain yellow-legged frog is and why they should care about them and also actually help to save a species, which mm-hmm. is pretty cool. Did you have any background with frogs at all or even an interest in frogs <laughs> before this? <laughs> Don't tell the frogs. <laughs> Don't. I would but tell I, all of them. I had no experience with amphibians like professionally or personally. Mm-hmm. I got, like I grew up in Hawaii and there's not any native, it depends who you ask, Mm -hmm. considered not to be any native species of amphibians in Hawaii. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. an island, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are invasives. There's like cane toads. There's cokey frogs. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some poison dart frogs that were introduced that some people consider endemic, but that's its own thing. But I didn't grow up around a lot of amphibians. Mm -hmm. Like, they just didn't really exist. And I certainly liked the idea of them but didn't know anything about them Mm -hmm. and so starting here was sort of the first introduction I had to them and I was so nervous starting to work with them because like a sea lion if like I don't know something happens like its water gets a little colder Mm -hmm. it's fine Mm -hmm. it's a mammal it's creating its own heat it's okay we kind of talked about that in our last episode with Reed you know there's you know our marine mammals can withstand a two degree um depending on the weather outside versus you know a 
endangered species like the mountain yellow legged frog yeah. who we have a permit to care for here you know that really can't fluctuate yeah and it was the most nerve-wracking transition mm-hmm. to take care of these like big things that are fine to mm-hmm. little things that maybe aren't fine if you do something <laughs> slightly mm-hmm. wrong and so there was a big learning curve for me because taking care of amphibians is so significantly different than marine mammals or seabirds or really anything that kind of regulates mm-hmm. itself And something I've come to learn to love about the amphibians is that they exist so in harmony with their environment that it's not really about caring for the individual animal, but ensuring that their habitat is clean Mm -hmm. and appropriate and that they have everything that they need. Mm -hmm. And if their environment is generally healthy, the animals are generally healthy. And I think that's a really, that was the biggest thing I had to Mm -hmm. like learn for myself is like, hey, you can kind of fix almost anything for a frog if you keep everything clean and nice and healthy and... I don't know. I just, that's not the case for seals and sea lions, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's been really fun. Well, it's not the case in the wild right now, unfortunately. And that's kind of, we'll get into why we are caring for these animals. So sad. But no, it's (laughs) such a bummer. But yeah, they, um, they really live in harmony with their environment and there is disharmony. What's that word? (laughs) There isn't harmony right now because of some anthropogenic causes, but what's anthropogenic? Human caused. Anthropogenic Mm -hmm. means human caused. And so a lot of people think that we live in the Anthropocene, which is just essentially we've done so much to alter the way that the world works that we are in a new era that Mm -hmm. is purely based off of all of the things that humans have done. And that's sort of disheartening to think about that we have done so much that it's sort of overcome the natural processes of the Mm -hmm. world. But at the same time, I think it also goes to show that humans have so much ability to change that there is hope. You know, like we did a lot of stuff, Mm -hmm. but we didn't know better at the time. And Mm -hmm. so now working to kind of rectify all those things and fix it, it's cool to see that we can have such a significant impact when we are trying. Can you name another example of something that we have done that with where there has been, you know, human caused issues and we've been able to reverse it? I'm not the expert on this at all, but I can think about the ozone and how... Yeah, that's there actually was a, a huge one. Yeah, the, the ozone is huge. Turns out you are an expert on this. <laughs> but um, I know that, you know, holes in the ozone were a huge issue or the breakdown of our ozone was a huge issue. And they were, well, were able to ban um, the substances or the chemicals that cause... Ga- CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. Yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> period <laughs> period <laughs> and the ozone has been repairing itself mm-hmm. and i'm not the expert on this so don't sounds like me you're on kind that. of the expert on this <laughs> no, expert yeah. on nothing that's a, that's my job here is to be the audience or again to ask you questions like I, I think it's a super pertinent example of like mm-hmm. how we can work to fix things that we've done and to be honest like we've done a lot of damage that we've already reversed it's just that it's not recent and so mm-hmm. we're not thinking about it but mm-hmm. like I'm in my master's program right now. One of the things that I am so shocked routinely to learn about is how bad air quality was Mm -hmm. in, especially California in like Mm -hmm. the fifties where you literally, there was like no days per year that it was healthy to go outside. And that's partially because of the geography of Southern California. Mm -hmm. And like there's this air basin that traps all the pollutants, but we also weren't regulating pollutants in any Mm -hmm. significant way that I think it was like last year's data or two years ago's data that there was only like one day where it was very unhealthy to go outside mm-hmm. um, versus like every other day. That's why all those old 1950s movies have that like yellow tint on it. It's the smog. <laughs> it's just the air. It's not the film. <laughs> it's the air. It's just how bad That's how everything was. looks then. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's <laughs> things like that, right, where we didn't even think about the effects that that was having mm-hmm. on us. But like, if you talk to someone from who grew up in, you know, that time, they'd be like, yeah, the air was so bad. I could not go outside some days. Mm-hmm. And I would like cough all the time. And mm-hmm. I was like, that sounds terrible. Like I yeah. never worried about that. Mm-hmm. And so, so lucky. we are working to fix things. And I think that now that we have more information, we're sort of obligated to undo a lot of the things that we've definitely done mm-hmm. and we are doing it. And so that makes me feel hopeful Especially when you think about the fact that over 40% of amphibian species are either considered endangered or threatened, which means that their habitat and their populations are declining in some significant way. I am really sad for all the frogs I'll never know. How many frogs are there? <laughs> There's a lot of frogs. <laughs> There's a lot Sorry, of frogs. I have to get, go. Yeah, get it out. <clears throat> oh, there it is. I had a frog in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> had to say it. <laughs> do it to him. Ba-da-ba. Had to do it to him. Um, but yeah. And so there's a lot of different species of frogs, mm-hmm. and I I learned about frogs that existed that I will never meet because they're gone now. And one that's really cool. That's so sad. I know. It is a real bummer. I can't think too much about it. I mean, like any species that's totally extinct now, mm-hmm. you're like, I wish I knew what that mm-hmm. was. 
But there was a gastric brooding frog. There was actually several gastric brooding frogs, but one very recently went extinct, like within the last 20 years, that would just raise its baby in its tummy, and it would just have a bunch of babies that would just crawl out of its mouth when they are ready. And that's cool. <laughs> Scott's like, face. Scott is horrifying. <laughs> Scott, you don't have to worry about it because it'll never happen oh. again. I know. Sad. The gastric brooding frogs are gone. Terrifying. And, and so sad. to prevent me from having that experience over and over again, we should really be working to preserve these species. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, sometimes I think about all the amphibians that I will never get to meet. And <laughs> that sounds really dorky, but th there's so many amphibians that have cool adaptations and can produce these like substances that might have antibacterial properties. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, these animals that play this huge role in their ecosystem because most amphibians exist as like a larval stage in the water mm -hmm. where they're eating detritus and like stuff off the What's bottom. What's detritus? Just like gunk. Okay. <laughs> like cool. scientific mm -hmm. word exactly. for gunk. Mm -hmm. And they'll eat algae and so they become these like primary consumers of like whatever is growing. Mm -hmm. And then they go through metamorphosis where their whole body changes and they become these like terrestrial animals that mostly eat insects or sometimes lizards. And so they connect the food web in such an different way than most mm -hmm. animals do because they totally transform what they're eating and what they're doing over the course of their lifetime that when you lose amphibians from those environments you lose a lot of that interconnectivity and it's just kind of weakens the strength of you know that ecosystem so i'll just never oh. know some of these frogs but mountain yellow-legged frogs are the ones that we are specifically working to save here at the aquarium and that's a project that started um before we got involved with it we are now a partner in that project but they have <laughs> taken over my life, as Madeline knows. <laughs> and they are one of the coolest frogs I've ever met. But there's nothing that special about them. Before anyone asks, nothing specifically <laughs> that special about them. Because I get that question all they the time. They have yellow legs. They do. Yes. Um, but there's also a foothill yellow-legged frog mm -hmm. and a Sierra yellow-legged frog. And so there's a line of yellow-legged frogs. Mm -hmm. But, um, and they're all pretty close related. But um, when people ask me why we're saving this specific species, and, you know, with sea otters and with sunflower stars, it's really easy. Like, that's a keystone species mm -hmm. that is protecting the entire environment. And sometimes you look at one frog and you're like, if they were gone, like, how would the ecosystem mm -hmm. be impacted? And part of the reason and the major reason is, like, we did this, so mm -hmm. we should be fixing it. Mm -hmm. And the other part is that, like, redundancy in any sort of ecological system is important for the health of that system. And so you want there to be multiple species of frogs. You want there to be, like, adaptability mm -hmm. to climate change and loss in different ways so that ecosystems can evolve as the world changes. And so if we lose a lot of those, like, variables and we lose a lot of those species, we're not going to see ecosystems bounce back the way that they should when there are climate-related impacts mm -hmm. or other things that happen to those habitats. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about, you know... So we know that this species isn't necessarily integral to its ecosystem, but what role do amphibians play in their ecosystems? Yeah, so they, like I said earlier, are usually just kind of a part of this trophic web that connects a lot of different animals together. And so they're part of the food chain is not really a good analogy. A food web is mm -hmm. a better analogy. Mm -hmm. And they allow there to be food and prey, but also predators for a lot of different species because of how diverse their diet is over the course of their life. And also amphibians, some people say they can be sort of ecological indicators of the health mm -hmm. of an ecosystem. I don't always agree with that mm -hmm. because it turns out frogs are much hardier than you think they are. Mm -hmm. I should have known that five years ago when I started working with them and I <laughs> panicked every time I had to do anything. <laughs> but if you think about how they've evolved over millions of years, they live now in desert ecosystems. They live now in like totally aquatic ecosystems. Mm -hmm. There's totally aquatic frogs. There's amphibians everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool that they are hardy enough and they can evolve so rapidly to adapt to change that's happening around them. But in the same vein, if you have a lot of chemicals in the water, you're going to kill all the frogs. Mm -hmm. So in that way, mm -hmm. it can be a really good indicator of the health of their overall environment. Very cool. Um, what's the difference between an amphibian and a reptile? That's a good question. So they are both considered herptiles or herps, um, but amphibians are... They have permeable skin. They don't typically have scales, although there's a couple exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of species of Sicilians have scales. Oh, really? Yeah. And they are mostly fossorial and terrifying. Don't look <laughs> them up. Um, we have some Sicilians here. We do. We mm -hmm. have aquatic Sicilians, which have no scales. And Adorable. They look like sock puppets. They're really cute. They're really cute. Do not Google what the inside of their mouth looks like. And if you need to, you can, but it's really scary. 
So if you're driving, listening to this, or you're if you're if you're stationary somewhere, not driving. Why would you say that? If I don't want driving. someone who's driving. <laughs> I don't want someone who's driving to look it up. Oh, okay. But you're put a note in your brain to look that up later it. because I guess it's terrifying. <laughs> I can't wait to see. Specifically, do not look it up if you're driving. <laughs> put a note in your brain. Pause this yeah. episode now. I think it's Typhlonectes natans, but look up aquatic exactly. Sicilian mouth. Ooh, do I get to quiz you on species names? Sure, now, since if you, you want to. Her, what's, what's Mountain Yellow Legged Frog's species name? Rana muscosa. If I didn't know that, it would all be over Let's for me, though. Cut, cut the mic. <laughs> cut the mic. She's canceled. She's done. <laughs> Scott, what happened? Oh, the, the mouth. You oh. Found it? <laughs> Let's see it. Is that this? Yeah. Ah, Ooh. that's what it looks like in Ugh. there. Is a little spooky in there? That's... That's that more than a little spooky. Oh. Um, aquatic Sicilians are really cool. Nature um, is so beautiful. <laughs> Nature is so wonderful. Um, apparently, the fossorial Sicilians that have scales are even scarier, and mm. I am scared to even Google them, so I wouldn't Don't. even do it. <laughs> but, they, I mean, they look like a big worm. Mm. But, um, yeah, what other what other quizzes you I don't know. What is, I don't know how many frogs. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Magnificent Tree Frog? I know that one. Yeah, those are... Latoria splendida? Is it Latoria? What about Sonoran Desert Toad? I'm thinking of the animals we have here. And we have Cilius alvarius. Exactly. That's what I was going <laughs> to exactly. say. That is exactly what I was going to say. Um, what about the... He used to be Bufo, but they've changed how they classify toads. No more Bufo? He's not a Bufo Alfred's not a Bufo anymore. No, anymore. Alfred's no Bufo. Alfred. He's no Bufo. <laughs> hmm. What other frogs do I know? Scott, what frogs do you know? Oh, spring peepers. We get a lot of those in spring Pennsylvania. Spring peepers. Spring I don't know peepers. what they're... It sounds normal. I want to look up what their thing is. Frogs. I mean, so I've seen loud. them. I don't think I know what they're... Chorus frogs. Oh, they're Sudacris. Yeah, yeah chorus frogs is right. But we have Sudacris. Which one do we have? We have Pacific tree frogs, which are Sudacris. Um, anyway, that's kind of cool. Do all frogs metamorphize? Uh, no. Some are direct developers, which is sort of interesting in and of itself. So the Kihansi spray toad, which I recognize is... Is it a frog? They, the common names always mess everything up. But they are direct developers, and so when they give birth, they just give birth to a tiny little version of themselves, and it is very cute. Um, if you ever want to see the cutest little thing in the entire world, look up Kihansi spray toads, which are native to Tanzania, But and then also look up how small their babies are, because look at the little oh, babies. Oh, that's the little really babies cute. Right now is back. Adorable. Um, but those guys actually have, I think, the smallest geographic footprint of any animal on the entire planet because they only live in the spray of the Kihansi waterfall in Tanzania, and then they dammed the waterfall. And turns out all that spray was super important for them to live. And so this population of amphibians went extinct in the wild, but thankfully they had been... Some of them had been collected for mm -hmm. a captive assurance colony, which essentially means that there are going to be some genetics that they retain so they can breed them and hopefully mm -hmm. reintroduce them. Mm -hmm. And they've been successfully reintroducing, reintroducing these animals for a while. So that's kind of cool. That is so wild to think that something that can be something so important to them, like the spray yeah. of this waterfall. And we don't even know. Until and we don't know gone. until we remove it. Mm -hmm. And then the, unfortunately it goes extinct in the wild. That's uh, yep. It's so impactful. Well, I think about an animal like the axolotl that, Mm -hmm. From my understanding, is only found in one mm -hmm. kind of one area lake of the world. in Mexico. One lake, yeah, exactly. And so here's crazy. something even more specific to this one waterfall. Yeah, they're Amazing. just a little less cute than axolotls. So I think Slightly. people care a little less. But when they are, I mean, the direct developers, they, I mean, just them popping out as a tiny toad from the mom mm -hmm. is very cute. And I was lucky enough to see a couple of them in person at the Detroit Zoo, um, where they are part of the conservation work for the Kihansi spray toad. And I was just so enamored by how tiny the little baby <laughs> toads were and how many of them, because under the right conditions, they're actually great breeders mm -hmm. and they do really well. It's just that they had dammed the waterfall and they didn't realize the impact that that mm -hmm. was going to have on these animals. So I think it's small changes that we don't necessarily think are going to cause problems. And I wonder how long it took them to adapt to that waterfall in order to... <laughs> it's probably so know? long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, we live here forever. Yeah, I guess we had... Be guess a part of this over. thing, and then it's removed. It's like, guess we gotta go. <laughs> guess it's all over for no. us. So it is interesting. I think they part of what they were doing conservation wise to help preserve the spray toads was they installed mister systems along mm -hmm. the waterfall because I think the dam is a hydroelectric dam. Like I do think there was a purpose for mm -hmm. it. But I know that they're trying to do things to help rectify, like and fix what they had removed. And I think that the spray helps. So those are interesting animals in and of themselves. But speaking of small things that we don't realize are going to damage an entire population. We can talk about mountain yellow legged frogs mm -hmm. now. I have one question for oh. you before we get into that. What's the difference between a toad and a frog? It's complicated. <laughs> it usually toads have thicker skin and are a little bit bumpier and wordier. Mm -hmm. And usually frogs have more smooth skin. 
Usually toads sort of walk. Mm. They can walk a little bit more than frogs typically Mm -hmm. do, and frogs will mostly hop. And there's a couple of different things, like toads tend to inhabit slightly drier Mm -hmm. habitats, and frogs tend to be more aquatic. But I'm using these words because they diverged a while ago, and there's frogs and there's toads, but they (laughs) can adapt to live in a bunch of different environments. Mm -hmm. And so Panamanian golden frogs are a perfect example. They look like a frog. They were called a frog, but then they realized that they're toads. Mm. And so although they're called frogs, they're mm-hmm. actually toads. And so it's sort of There's confusing. so much of that in every single yeah. family of animal that we've talked about. And I think it's sort of like becomes one of those things that there's not a great one way to tell versus the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually if you see something sort of like wide and bumpy, mm-hmm. is a toad. Is is it like all frogs are toads, all toads are Mm-mm. frogs? No, they're just they're separate, separate things. things. Um, which is interesting. I think they all fall under anurins. Um, and so the order anura is frogs and toads. Mm-hmm. And those are two separate things. Got it. Understood. Cool. All right. Let's talk about your Understood. faves. My, my favorite frogs. Mm-hmm. Um, so mountain yellow-legged frogs are one of those perfect examples of humans changing something in their habitat that we didn't realize was going to cause a huge issue for them. So at one point, and these frogs live in like pristine alpine environments. Mm-hmm. They live in fishless waterways. They live in areas where the water is coming from snow melt. So fish never made it all the way up there. Mm-hmm. And they can live at altitudes of like 1,000 to 12,000 feet. Super high up. Yeah. And so they're also cold weather frogs, which is weird to think about. Mm-hmm. But regardless. And so there's these mountain frogs. And then people in the 1800s started settling around California. And they were like, hey, you know what would be really cool is if we could do some fishing. And they started introducing trout, specifically, I think, rainbow trout, to the waterways where the mountain yellow-legged frogs lived. Mm -hmm. And it turns out trout eat everything. Mm -hmm. And so between the 1800s and about the 1960s or 70s, when they were still doing these trout introductions, they didn't realize that all of the tadpoles of the mountain yellow-legged frogs were just being sucked up by all these trout that Mm -hmm. were up there. And... Mm -hmm. Fun fact about Mm -hmm. mountain yellow-legged frogs is they can take up to four years to get out of the water and metamorphose. They spend a really long time as a tadpole, Mm -hmm. especially if it's a little bit colder that year and they're not getting the nutrients that they need. (laughs) So there would be these like super plump four-year-old tadpoles just chilling in the water and then these trout would come around and just eat all of them. So it was a bit That's of a devastating to their populations. It takes so long for them to even get to a point <laughs> that they're coming out of the water and then they're just being, yeah, yep. slurped up before they even get there. So yep. I'm assuming that really led to their extinction pretty quickly. Um, it was a major cause of decline. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at one point, everything I've read says that they used to be the most populous vertebrate in their entire range at the time that they weren't being all mm-hmm. eaten by a drought. <laughs> and, you know, if you read, like, old school textbooks, a lot of them are like, you couldn't go five feet without seeing a mountain yellow-legged frog. And I wow. was like, that's cool. <laughs> and to cool. think now, like, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. There are estimated to be less than 200 breeding age adults in the wild. And I went on a field trip specifically to see them at a site where We knew that they existed, Mm -hmm. and we still only saw, like, five. Mm -hmm. And they were all juveniles, and Mm -hmm. none of them were adults. I've never seen an adult of this species that I work so closely Mm -hmm. with, which is crazy to think about. But, yeah, so trout was a major cause of decline. And, you know, any sort of introduced predator or introduced species is going to have impacts that we don't necessarily think about. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just like, we want to go fishing. Here's Mm -hmm. some trout. Mm -hmm. And... These Let's animals evolved. These yeah, with, they've yeah. never had predators in their mm-hmm. waterway because they evolved in a fishless system mm-hmm. that all of a sudden there's these trout that are just coming and eating all mm-hmm. the little tadpoles. Mm-hmm. So that was a major cause of decline. And when they realized that, they were like, we should probably do something about this. So they started working to reverse that and they started doing trout removal in specific sites. Mm-hmm. And they actually saw the population bounce back. Mm-hmm. And it was really exciting because they're like, oh, okay, it's the trout. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. When Fish. would you say this was about? I think they started doing that in the late 70s or 80s, okay. but don't quote me on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're still doing trout removal to this day for mm-hmm. some of these habitats. Like, there are still, like, invasive trout species that are in waterways where they shouldn't be. And so part of making the habitat suitable for mountain yellow-legged frogs again is taking the trout mm-hmm. out of the water. And unfortunately, it's never good news for the trout. But um, Trout doing okay? The trout are fine. Okay. I mean, like, as a species, <laughs> yeah, they're as a species fine. species overall. Mm-hmm. But um, they weren't supposed to be in yeah. those places. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, that was something that really 
was one of the first things that we did to help the species. They started and coming back a little bit. They did. Mm-hmm. And they were they were doing okay. They were like, okay, cool. Like a few years later, once all the stupid tadpoles <laughs> got out of the water after they took their sweet time, mm-hmm. then they started seeing mountain frogs again. And then it wasn't until the 90s that they started describing this massive loss of amphibians worldwide. Mm-hmm. And everyone was like, what's going on? And apparently it was at some conference that scientists came together and they're like, this is the species that I primarily study and I can't find it anywhere. And other people were having the same experience where they'd come up to each other and they'd be like, I also can't find my species anywhere. Or there's like only two individuals where previously there were thousands. There's abundance, yeah. And it turns out that there has been a disease process that has been attacking amphibians worldwide and it is a fungal disease called chytridiomycosis caused by Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis, mm-hmm. which is also known as I was BD. Say that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> BD or chytrid fungus. And we didn't really know a lot about it mm-hmm. until the late 90s and like the early 2000s we were studying it much more closely. And it turns out that these massive amphibian die-offs around the world were all tied to the same fungus, mm-hmm. which is weird. Yeah. And so they've done some research to figure out what happened and why. And chytrid is basically implicated in the de- decline of most amphibian species. Mm. Um, I think there are very few that show any sort of, like, resistance to it. And it's sort of a bummer. I mean, like, it's not something we talk about, yeah. but it is a huge disease process that is wiping out this incredibly diverse, um, you know, range of animals. Mm-hmm. Two questions. Is it affecting any other species besides amphibians that you know of? Um, As far as I know, it's not anything besides amphibians, but it is frogs, toads, salamanders, Mm -hmm. newts. Like, it's all amphibians. There's Mm -hmm. also um, B. sal, which is Batrachochytrium salamandrivorans, Mm -hmm. which is a very, sounds like a (laughs) spell. (laughs) Salamandrivorans. But that one is a slightly different, similar fungus, like same Mm -hmm. um, genus, but causes slightly different issues. But both funguses attack the skin of the Mm -hmm. amphibians. And so the reason I'm not quite sure if it affects anyone else is because what it does is it attacks the keratinized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It attacks the keratinized portion of the skin. And so this little fungus will settle into their little skin Mm -hmm. and then it'll start kind of like eating at the keratin essentially Mm -hmm. of their skin and their body's immune reaction is to just thicken up their skin. And so you get these animals where if you take like a microscope slide of what's happened, Mm -hmm. you just see these areas of like extremely abnormal thickening of the epidermis Mm -hmm. and It doesn't sound that crazy, except that when you think about how frogs and toads regulate their, like, electrolyte balance and, like, hydration, it's through their skin. Mm -hmm. And so it can impact the respiration. It can Mm -hmm. impact their ability to take in water when Mm -hmm. they need to. It impacts their ability to sort of be in balance with their environment. move even if there's (laughs) uncomfortable areas of thick skin. Yeah. I never had an uncomfortable area of thick skin. I don't actually know what that's like. I don't know what that's like. But... I mean, I'm making light of a very sad situation (laughs) because I have to. But, um, yeah, it causes all of these problems. And, like, their electrolyte imbalance then makes their organs fail and also makes their muscles not work. And so very characteristic signs of chytrid fungus in frogs would be, you know, frogs always sit, like, all kind of, like, scooched up with their Mm -hmm. legs poised, ready Mm -hmm. to bounce at any moment. They'll sit with their legs all the way kind of relaxed back, and it looks weird. And so if you see frogs doing that, it's unfortunately probably not a good sign. Mm -hmm. But it also causes mortality pretty rapidly Mm -hmm. in populations. And so they had seen this bounce back of mountain frogs after they started removing trout. And they're like, we did it. And then I think it was in the 90s and early 2000s, they started going to these historic mountain yellow-legged frog sites. And they would just find waterways full of dead frogs. And I mean, frogs decay pretty fast, which means that those had just died also. And yeah, I can't even imagine being someone who's like, I'm going out to study my species Mm -hmm. of interest. And they're Mm -hmm. all dead. And Walking up there and knowing how much work you did to restore a species Mm -hmm. and then seeing that must be so devastating. So not to be too much of a bummer. Mm -hmm. It's it's still out there and Mm -hmm. it's still pretty bad. And do we we know what causes chytrid fungus? Is that um it's caused by the fungus, but we think that it was Mm -hmm. spread worldwide. It's complicated and there's a lot of different theories. Mm -hmm. Um some genetic tests think that it may be originated in Asia. But there is, you can like trace it back to Europe and Africa also. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different places around the world. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite stories, it's a little bit of a messed up story, about one of the probable causes of chytrid spread. One, it was bullfrogs because people like eating frog legs. And Mm -hmm. they started shipping bullfrogs around the world to eat Mm -hmm. them. And it turns out worldwide trade of amphibians will cause disease spread like no one's business. Mm -hmm. And bullfrogs are slightly resistant to it. Mm -hmm. And so they could be carriers 
be shipped to a different country. All around the world. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then if they escape or are let out or interact with native populations mm-hmm. in any way or just get into a waterway, that fungus can cause spores that end up in the water. The spores are modal and will go towards the chemicals that come Whoa. off of a frog. Uh-huh. And then they'll settle in that frog and spread and spread and spread. And so as soon as they spread, like settle, they create more spores that then go back out into mm-hmm. water. And so it's extremely contagious. And so it's not just like frog to frog contact that will mm-hmm. cause it. It's just being in, in the, the same water waterway, way, mm-hmm. which is terrifying. Horrifying. But the funny story, if we have time for it, <laughs> And it's only funny because it's so weird, Mm -hmm. is in the 19, I think it's 40s, there was something called the Hogbins test. That was a type of pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. And it was Xenopus lavis, which I think is the African clawed frog, um, was used as a pregnancy test by injecting the urine of a pregnant woman into the frog's back. And the presence of whatever hormone indicated pregnancy would Mm -hmm. cause this frog to express all of these eggs and like spheres. And it was a surprisingly accurate pregnancy test, Mm -hmm. despite being horrible and like not great for the frog. Mm -hmm. I think they were probably one time use if I had to guess. Like, I don't really know how it impacted. There's not a lot of data on how it impacted the frogs. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's great. You Mm -hmm. can't usually inject pee into something and have it be fine. But because it was so effective as a pregnancy test, these African clawed frogs started being shipped worldwide Mm -hmm. because this is the most accurate pregnancy test, like 98% Mm -hmm. effective. And so they started shipping these animals all around the world. And those animals also are carriers of chytrid fungus. Mm -hmm. And so between the two things and between, you know, us moving and being a little bit more international and sort of international trade developing over the last century or so it was bound to happen but Mm -hmm. man it is devastating (laughs) okay so where are we at today with this with the species and its population in the wild mountain yellow legged frogs Mm -hmm. so many frogs in my life um so yeah we think that there are less than 200 breeding age adults in the Mm -hmm. wild and i think that's sort of the best way to measure population status because Mm -hmm. you can measure juveniles but they take a few years to reach maturity too and so there's almost no point in knowing how many individuals there are total unless they're also contributing to creating more Mm -hmm. individuals. Mm -hmm. It's not too many. Um, They've had chytrid, they've had the trout, and then most recently and sort of unfortunately just the cherry on top is all of the things that have come along with climate change in Mm -hmm. California. And so we had a pretty bad fire that happened in 2020 that essentially 90 to 95 percent of the remaining usable habitat for the mountain yellow-legged frogs got all burned up. Rough. (laughs) Rough. Not doing great. And it's only funny to me because I'm so familiar with it that I'm like, man, they are taking their licks. Yeah. (laughs) You have to laugh. Otherwise they'll cry. But after that fire, I guess if you could say the silver lining Mm -hmm. is that that sort of really um, catalyzed our involvement mm-hmm. with the Mountain Yellow Legged Frog Project because there were these tadpoles that they rescued from the fire that they were like, these guys need a home. Mm-hmm. And so we accelerated our timeline for being part of the project to accommodate these. So this project had already existed before this fire. With other institutions, mm-hmm. yes. And it was in our, I think, vague plan of mm-hmm. the future Eventually. to be involved with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously COVID happened and that mm-hmm. was not ideal for any mm-hmm. institution and sort of halted some of our development in this program. Mm-hmm. But um, when this fire happened, it really did sort of catapult us into we should really be involved sooner. Mm-hmm. And so we received the first year that we were involved with Mountain Yellow Gift Frogs. We got 150 captive bred tadpoles from LA Zoo, who's an amazing partner in this project. And they have adult mountain yellow-legged frogs that they will go through the process of breeding. Mm -hmm. And then they would have tadpoles. And to head start the tadpoles, like I said, could take up to four years. And so they have other institutions that are partners that receive the tadpoles and grow them up. Mm -hmm. Under the right conditions, they can metamorphose in about a year. Mm -hmm. So it's not that crazy of a commitment when you're providing them all the things that they need. Mm -hmm. But um, they gave us 150 of those, and then they gave us 125 fire tadpoles. (laughs) That they're like, these guys almost died in a wildfire. Mm -hmm. You guys are going to take care Mm -hmm. of them now. And we're like, this is our first time ever doing this. And they're like, these are wild collected and extremely genetically Mm -hmm. valuable. Mm -hmm. But um, the challenge was accepted on our behalf. And we successfully raised so many of those animals. So we released 188 frogs last year. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is significant when you think about the 200 breeding age adults that are remaining in the wild. Um... 188 is a huge 
impact. They essentially doubled their population. For like a day, probably. I'm hopeful that the recruitment rate is pretty good, but we don't know, right? Like, yeah, you have to be realistic about it, right? Yeah. Because are right, so are they do they currently have predators? I mean, yeah, there, they've yeah. got predators. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's trout in some of the waterways, mm-hmm. although I'm pretty sure where they're releasing them doesn't. Mm-hmm. I'm actually not even allowed to know where, yeah. mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. It's but it is in Southern California. Mm-hmm. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah, okay. these guys mm-hmm. are native to the population that we have are from the San Gabriel Mountain Range. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, good luck finding them there. <laughs> there's so few of them. So, but they are in the San Gabriels. Mm-hmm. And um, this population is, at least. And so we have... Um, Some more tadpoles that we're raising up and hopefully releasing pretty soon. Maybe by the time this podcast episode is even out. (laughs) Maybe. We don't know. Um, What should you do if you see a mountain yellow? Do not touch it. (laughs) Please don't touch (laughs) it. Leave it it alone. Do not set fire to its habitat. Do not pass go. Do Do not collect $200. Mm -hmm. Um, No, I mean, genuinely. Do not let the frogs give you $200. (laughs) That is their money. If they can, they could afford (laughs) it. They need it. They are, they, they live in large here at the aquarium at least. <laughs> um, but I think if you see those animals, and I think something to be, I don't know, a good steward of mm-hmm. any amphibian environment is to be extremely cognizant that chytrid is a super contagious disease mm-hmm. and it's caused by fungus spores. And so if you are hiking through habitat of different amphibians and you regularly do that, mm-hmm. maybe just disinfect your shoes when mm-hmm. you get home and like be more mindful of mm-hmm. how you might actually be spreading disease processes when you walk through these places because you can ask anyone I know I will go out herping all the time mm-hmm. I love finding frogs I love and herping finding... is herping is going to find herptiles which mm-hmm. are reptiles and amphibians mm-hmm. I'm sorry about that um <laughs> It's a very weird it's term a funny name. if you don't yes. explain yes. it. But, you know, I specifically will go to try to find them in their natural mm-hmm. habitat. One, because I think they're cool. Mm-hmm. But two, it gives me such a better understanding of what I'm trying to replicate mm-hmm. if we have them here and, mm-hmm. like, how to meet their needs. And what I think they're just really cute to find mm-hmm. out. So, <laughs> and so seeing what natural behaviors they might be displaying that I want to give them the opportunity to display and seeing where they live. And so seeing mountain yellow-legged frogs in their habitat gave me so much context to what I'm doing mm-hmm. and where they live. And like they live in a super high flow, super cold water environment. And so we have spray bars that really increase the flow of our tanks so that they practice swimming better mm. and grow stronger legs mm-hmm. that might prepare them for we're release. Training them. Yeah, we're <laughs> we just put little like sweatbands on all of them. The cutest thing would. ever. Um, so they are hopefully in recovery, but it's been a tough couple of mm-hmm. years. I and mean, if you guys, if you live in California, you might know we've had some really bad summers. We've had mm-hmm. wildfires, we've had droughts, and mm-hmm. all of those things impact the ability of these animals to survive. I mean, a tadpole in a little pond that dries up ain't gonna make it. And yeah. especially if they're gonna take four years, four years to, get to get out get of the pond. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, there's that, and there's also habitat fragmentation so if you know waterways dry up and there's only isolated little ponds then that can actually create distinctly isolated populations Mm -hmm. of these animals and so they're not they're not having the best time Mm -hmm. out there but we're hopeful that with all the work that we're doing in addition to all the work that our partners are doing and it's not just you know us through u.s geological survey Mm -hmm. yeah who else is involved san diego zoo is involved Mm -hmm. um they are doing a lot actually and they actually do some research as well to Mm -hmm. understand better about what's going on with the animals and understand their anatomy and sort of what a mountain yellow-legged frog is. Mm -hmm. We're not doing any research here at the aquarium, but we are doing quite a bit of head starting. We have a pretty big capacity to Mm -hmm. receive animals and raise them. And we're really hopeful that this year we might get to release about 90 to 100 more frogs, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. And we have three systems here. One has big frogs in it. They are big. (laughs) My favorite one, and he will be memorialized in this podcast, is named Big Chicken because he looks like a chicken sitting on eggs. And he is like twice the size of the next biggest frog. Big chicken. We love big chicken. chicken. So he's We'll make him the cover photo for the podcast. (laughs) Can you be be next season's cover is just big chicken yelling into microphones? (laughs) I need to get a picture of him with his mouth open. Um, But yeah, he's cool. We have just a bunch of animals that are waiting to have a nice home Mm -hmm. to be released. And then USGS will let us know when it's time. And then they take our frogs and they put them out there. So that room or that space is technically behind the scenes. And we Mm kind of chatted about that last week with Reed, who built the room and and plumbed it alongside you. And, you know. No, he 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 really did it. it. (laughs) Him and the life support team really did that. Um, But will our guests... 
on site ever be able to see a mountain yellow legged frog displayed? Yes. Is that ever is that planned? It's a good question. I think that it's something that we would love to incorporate. Stay tuned, maybe. maybe. I maybe. hope mm-hmm. um, because I don't know. They're cool. I probably I don't think that most people would look at them and be like, Whoa. "Wow." <laughs> But it's the story, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's absolutely, and that's the same with most species. Is like mm-hmm. it's all about what happened to them and sort of like learning more about them as individuals. Mm-hmm. Something that is really cool that I've never smelled that sounded weird <laughs> is <laughs> apparently when they're threatened, they release a garlic smell. Uh-huh. Um, I haven't threatened them enough, I guess, because they've never done it to me. Um, but that's cool. You know, like what is yeah, that? Why are you making that? a Why weird garlic smell? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It probably smells good. So to if you're me. walking in. The San Gabriel Mountains, and you smell garlic nearby. It's probably garlic because there are so few frogs out there. <laughs> it's probably actually just someone it's camping. It's probably so some garlic. garlic. Um, no, but there, I mean, there are species that we should save because we did it to them. Mm-hmm. You know, everything mm-hmm. that's happening to them is human caused. And they're animals that evolved to live in this like predatorless mm-hmm. cold waterway. And so they're okay living at 12,000 feet in the air. Mm-hmm. And so when you think about these creatures that have evolved over so many years to inhabit these extremely niche ecosystems, and then you think about us just being like, here's some fish, here's some disease, Mm -hmm. and we've just kind of really messed with that cycle, I think that that's a little bit disheartening. So it's been sort of the most inspiring thing to be a part of, and I didn't get to attend the release last year. Apparently it was quite the trek into the mountains, Mm -hmm. and... They knew I would slow them down, and <laughs> let's be honest, I would have. Because you have to carry a cooler full of frogs mm-hmm. up a mountain. Like mm-hmm. I can't do that. I could barely walk up a mountain myself. Not <laughs> let alone Cooler-less. with like two hundred yeah. frogs mm-hmm. on my back. Two hundred um, endangered frogs. On yeah, back. I would. Yeah. I would tumble down the mountain. Mm-hmm. Then I'd be like, just go. Just they deserve go to go. Me. So, but they did send this picture that was like my phone background for months mm. because it was just one of our frogs on a rock in the wild. Mm. And I was like, that's the coolest thing oh, I've maybe cry. ever seen. Yeah, that's I awesome. Because that's so much work that went into just that one frog in order to be reintroduced. <laughs> Better to make it. <laughs> what's, what's his name? I didn't name him. You should name him. Gabriel. <laughs> San <Case>. Gabriel. <laughs> his name is Gabriel. So, I hope you're out there, Gabriel. Hope you're out there. It was funny. Thriving. For the couple weeks after we released them, I would think about them. And be like, I wonder what they're up to. You know, like, I got to know you guys over the last year. Yeah. I mean, there was so many of them that mm-hmm. it was hard to know them each you individually. You walk into the mountains, they all jump on you. They're hey. like, mama! <laughs> um, but at the same time, I would just think about them and be like, I wonder who's out there. Like, yeah. who's making it? What mm-hmm. bugs are you eating? Yeah. And we're constantly looking for ways to improve our project, too, and set them up for better success. So this year, we held on to a couple more of them until they were a little bigger. Mm-hmm. Maybe they do better when they're released bigger, which would make sense to me, because then they're not three grams going out into, like, <laughs> a river. But yeah. Mm-hmm. They do okay. I mean, big it's chicken cool. sized. But, yeah, we need That's to release ideal. big chitins. I call him big chitin. <laughs> like he is some monster mm-hmm. size. And when they are first metamorphosed, they're three grams. He's gonna make it. I hope so. He's gonna make and it. he's kind of funny because he'll. I call him a dead monster. I, I have a lot of names for him, <laughs> but he likes to sit under this rock. And mm-hmm. then if a cricket like crawls by, he'll like launch out and eat it, and then go back into his little den. And I was like, if anyone's not gonna get eaten by a bird, it's a big chicken. <laughs> he, like, knows. he knows what's up. Get back in there. What are they eating here at the aquarium, and what do they typically eat in the wild? Yeah, it's so it's I've done a little bit of research on what their natural diet is. And back in the seventies, when there was like a million of them, mm-hmm. they used to catch them and they would open up their stomachs to see what the contents were and there were beetles and there were like pond skaters and some like flies Mm -hmm. those things are not easy for us to source Mm -hmm. as like a live food option Mm -hmm. and so I've been doing my darndest to try to get them food that is close Mm -hmm. and so they do eat crickets that is a larger part of their diet because that is easy to source Mm -hmm. the crickets are gut loaded and also dusted with vitamins um and for those of you who might own frogs, vitamins are important for frogs. Mm-hmm. Um, they get calcium from those vitamins in addition to UV supplementation helps their bones grow. Mm-hmm. So supplement your frogs. Supplement your frogs. Um, but they're also eating things like fruit flies. And I've recently introduced dubia roaches to mm-hmm. some of our bigger frogs that can handle that sort of tough exoskeleton. Crunchy. Yeah. And I wanted it to mimic beetles, you know, mm-hmm. like get used to eating mm-hmm. stuff that mm-hmm. you might see something <laughs> like it. And I've recently started seeing this really cool behavior from some of our biggest frogs where they sit at the water surface with just their eyes out and their whole body is like poised to strike. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm like, there is nothing that mm-hmm. I am feeding you that would like skate across the surface. Mm-hmm. But I could so see that being hunting behavior to catch like a, spo- a pond skater, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. there it is, there it is. And then just launch themselves mm-hmm. at it. Mm-hmm. So. Their instincts are there. Yeah, the instincts are there. The mm-hmm. food is not. <laughs> so they're eating. But hopefully will be. Is there any threat to their food in the wild right now? Or is it pretty abundant? Not that I know bugs, of. I certainly, when I was hiking, bugs be, bugs out, be there. out there. I guess mm-hmm. I don't know if it's their favorite bugs, mm-hmm. but bugs be out there. So I definitely got a lot bugs, of mosquito bugs, bites. Bugs. <laughs> it was out there. That's something that I didn't talk about is we, there was recently a study that showed amphibians are important because they control mosquito populations. Yeah. So if you care about amphibians. If you care about getting bit. We care about amphibians. <laughs> if you hate mosquitoes, yeah. love amphibians. That's well, everything kind of... has a role in the ecosystem, yeah. right? But... Except mosquitoes. <laughs> Go away. Do they no, really I not don't... have any purpose? Um, it depends just annoys. You ask. I'm yeah. sure they do, mm-hmm. but I don't. I am very susceptible. Or anti. This is an anti mosquito podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have on We're like a mosquito a es- expert next season and be like, what do we. Anyways, so. Yeah, that's kind of what we're doing here at the aquarium. Cool. The care is pretty intensive. Mm-hmm. I wish that it was a little bit easier to display, and I hope that someday it is. Um, it's so much work that you're doing just behind the scenes. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a really fun story to to hear about and yeah. and see and you know getting the access to the room and, and seeing you know what you're doing back there has been really awesome too. And seeing Bid Chitin. he's so cute. He's so cute. He's really cute. Everyone who has come into that room, like, to do maintenance or, like, a couple of people have come in there, I've specifically shown them big chicken. I was like, this is the biggest mountain yellow like You will ever see. I have ever mm-hmm. seen as someone who has seen way more <laughs> than most well, people. We have more big chickens. What will be the next name? Bigger chicken? Goose. <laughs> Large goose. <laughs> Eagle. Eagle. As they continue to grow, just continue. This is enormous ostrich. He's he's a 600-pound mountain yellow. Like frog, 300 or 30 feet long. That's my dream. Um, So he's the dream. No, I, I really hope that their populations start to recover. And we're hoping that sort of as animals adapt to Kittred and that mm-hmm. becomes more of a normal part of their life, that they also start to find ways to adapt and evolve alongside it. Um, There's some evidence to suggest that maybe frogs sun themselves so heavily because chytrid doesn't do well Mm, with heat. mm -hmm. And so they're actually just cooking the fungus off their back to like Mm -hmm. get it off me. Mm -hmm. Um, And then interestingly, tadpoles are really not impacted by chytrid Mm. as much because their skin isn't keratinized. There's Mm -hmm. no keratin in their epidermis. Mm -hmm. There is keratin in their little raspy mouth parts though. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if a tadpole has chytrid, mm-hmm. you could tell by abnormalities of the oral disc. Mm. So their little mouth parts won't mm-hmm. be developed properly or they'll be sort of eaten away by that. So chytrid is an ever-present risk. And mm-hmm. so part of the reason why we have such strict biosecurity around our mountain yellow-legged frogs is to prevent introduction because we've tested them before we release them just to be, you know, doing our due diligence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just you don't want to release. <laughs> yeah, that would be so Yeah, sad. that would be detrimental. <laughs> mm-hmm. So... We have like a foot bath, a boot change that goes into it. We mm-hmm. have very strict um, cross contamination protocols that you can't work with mountain frogs if you've worked with the amphibian gallery. Mm-hmm. And not to say that anyone in the gallery has chytrid, like that's not the case, mm-hmm. but you never know what diseases you might be introducing when mm-hmm. you work with similar species in the same day. So we are pretty strict about our mountain legged frogs. That's half the reason they're behind the scenes too, mm-hmm. is to create this little bubble. Also, I will be lying to you if I told you that that wasn't my favorite room because it's air conditioned. I know it's, it's really nice so on a hot nice. day. <laughs> it's like ninety three degrees today, mm-hmm. and it is sixty four degrees in there, and the water is fifty. And so, if I'm doing water changes, I'll come out shivering, and everyone's like, "What is wrong with you? It is ninety degrees." Out like, here. You don't know what I'm just doing. You don't know what I've been I was through in the tundra. I have been in the alpine mountain <laughs> lakes of the mountain frogs. <laughs> So it's been really great. And That's awesome. Yeah. Shout out to Frankie, wherever you are listening yeah, to this. Wherever you are. I know you're listening. Frankie and I both um, had sort of the experience of like after that first round was released, it almost felt mm-hmm. like our kids went to, co- to yeah, college. Yeah, you know, empty like, nest. There they go. They're doing so well. And to see that picture. Here's 150 more. Yeah. <laughs> Here's all your babies back. So that was. That I mean, it's a really That's salient awesome. point, right? It's an ever-going mm-hmm. project because as soon mm-hmm. as we release, we're trying to take on more and yeah. continue to grow up more. And we've expanded our capacity recently. We have mm-hmm. a third system running, whereas we had two for the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. So we're pretty happy with it. That's and awesome. if you ever want to be air-conditioned, too bad because I'm the only one. <laughs> 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 you can't. <laughs> no, it's it's really nice, That's and awesome. I'm very lucky. Well, it's so great hearing you talk about it, and I know your dedication to it, and I'm lucky to see that up close. Them. I actually, <laughs> actually don't like frogs at all. No, it's been really cool, and I, I learned so much through this episode, and you know, being close with you and hearing about them one-on-one has been awesome. 
all the time. All the time. <laughs> Constantly. Constantly. At every point. Yeah, hey, can I tell you about these frogs? Can I tell you yeah, about what my I frogs are doing today? Right. They were being so Show cute today. Chicken. So many pictures wow, and videos. Wow, one gram bigger. Wow. Hey. Awesome. No, I'm proud of him. Leave big chicken alone. I'm so proud you of him. You can roast the other ones, but big <laughs> chicken is <laughs> unroastable. <laughs> He's our star quarterback. Roast another He's chicken. Like, yeah. <laughs> Roast another chicken. That's awesome. Well, are there any conservation efforts that you hope to be a part of coming up in your career here at the Aquarium <laughs> of the Pacific? I think we do a lot. And I think with sea otter surrogacy and mountain yellow-legged frogs, I certainly get to be a part of a lot of our mm-hmm. front-facing conservation work. Um, as I always introduce myself in the beginning of the episode, I am my position now is conservation coordinator for mammals and birds. And that and position frogs. and frogs. We just <laughs> I think our department is called mammals and birds, but frogs fall under. Amphibians. Us. But with my new position, I get to help identify sort of what projects our aquarium can like work towards. And one of the things that I've been working on is having people volunteer for habitat restoration mm-hmm. and other conservancies that are local. And also get some hands-on experience doing other things. Um, I get to have help coordinate some of our training for the Old Wildlife Care Network. So some of our staff are actually trained to respond to an oil spill and save whatever wildlife Mm -hmm. might be impacted by that oil spill. And so I get to help coordinate some of those efforts um, now with Frankie also, which is very fun. And so Frankie's our invisible guest. <laughs> yeah, Frankie's we really here. need to have her on. <laughs> we will. That would be awesome. Um, but I do think that it's been cool to see like these other people come through my life and grow up in their careers and move on to other mm-hmm. things, but have them still be connections. Frankie is coordinating a lot of the volunteer response for the Oil Wildlife Care Network. And so mm-hmm. I still get to talk to my yeah, friends. Yeah, all connected. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this is what networking means. <laughs> this, is what, this is being a professional and like knowing people. But also it's just so amazing to see people grow into these roles and become this like overarching network mm-hmm. of like we're gonna save the a world. Team that is, yeah, that's amazing. I think it's great that the aquarium is getting involved into habitats before there's a huge problem. Yeah, Maybe and- there's kind of symptoms of a problem starting, but you know things aren't necessarily going extinct. But we're also hopping on to um, traumatic, <laughs> traumatic issues. Yeah, we're, traumatic's not the right word. We but respond to a lot of different like a disasters. Oil spells. Yeah, yeah like disaster is the right word. Traumatic, traumatic disaster. And mm-hmm. we had some staff respond to the Huntington Beach oil spill that happened yeah. in 2021. To have a network of responders that can respond to anything, you know, at a given moment mm-hmm. is really cool. And it's not easy to respond to the wildlife portion of an oil spill because you are having to pick up an yeah. angry wild bird mm-hmm. or, you know, it's something never been weird. handled before. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. the Oil Wildlife Care Network is this amazing organization that kind of links together different people at different institutions that creates this network that like, hey, there's an oil spill in San Diego. We have local San Diego responders who will then go out and do mm-hmm. it. Or if there's one in Huntington Beach, we got mobilized for that. And so we really get to be a part of a lot of different things. And I like having people trained and at the ready mm-hmm. to go rather than trying to retroactively train people when something happens. Exactly. We're ready. Because unfortunately, stuff happens. Stuff happens. Yeah. But we're here to st- to fix it when mm-hmm. it happens, I guess. Yeah, and to maybe prevent it from happening in the first place. But that's going to take a little extra work. Yeah. For now, we for will now. raise the frogs and release them. Well, and thank you so much, Erin, for being my guest today <gasps> on my podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our podcast, Aquarium <laughs> oh. of the Pacific. It was really great to hear about your passion for these it's too much little frogs. frogs. It's too much, too frogs. much frogs. And and one big frog. A big chicken. <laughs> I think that I should send you guys a picture of a big chicken. I think you should. I think you should. He should be the cover photo. He looks like he's sitting on eggs like a chicken. He's cute. I hope we get to release them pretty soon. That would be awesome. And I do want to say thank you to all the partners in the Mountain Yellow Good Frog Program because it's it takes a village to raise truly a <laughs> clutch of tadpoles. <laughs> and I know that sounds really silly, but like, you know, even our life support department built that entire room. They were there today doing maintenance to make sure that the chillers keep the water cold enough. And we have facilities who helps maintain, like, the way the AC system works in there to keep it cool enough in there. And we have all the husbandry staff who are involved with it. And then we have these partner organizations. Then we have this, like, overarching management system. And it's just so many people working together to save a species. It's really neat to see. That's awesome. Superheroes. Superheroes. But frogs. Frogs. (laughs) But, I just picture little frogs with little capes. Big Super chicken. frog. Put a cape on Big Chicken. Oh, my goodness. Super Big Chicken. <laughs> That's just when he gets bigger. Just, We're just yeah. going to call him Super He'll Big get Chicken. There. He'll get there. Cool. Well, thank so. you so much, Aaron. That was awesome. And thank you so much to everybody who listened to our season. We're podcasters. 
Whoa. We made a whole season. And thank you to everyone who participated in this season, yeah. too. I learned about turtles and mm-hmm. sharks and mm-hmm. jellies and mm-hmm. sea stars and facilities and life support mm-hmm. and basically everything that we do here. So I think we're done. The podcast is <laughs> over. <laughs> no, we won't be done. We will be. Blah, blah, blah. We won't. We are not done. We'll be back in a couple months with season two. So let us know what you thought about this season. Let us know what you liked. Yeah. Um, I'm sensitive, so don't tell us anything you did. <laughs> Madeline is the one that receives the comments. She mm-hmm. shows me sometimes one of them just said great information, which I really loved mm-hmm. seeing that feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, but also thank you, Scott, who's been quietly sitting Scott. here all season. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just listening to us. It's mm-hmm. been my pleasure. <laughs> Our number one listener. Our nice <laughs> Scott Shaw. He has listened to he every really episode. But yeah. It's been great. And thank you guys so much for listening. Please write in to any avenue that mm-hmm. you can contact the aquarium. Madeline manages a lot of our social media. And so if you Instagram message mm-hmm. or Pretty Facebook much if message. You do anything on social media and you tag us at it, I'm going to see it. So I'd love to hear your feedback, what you want to hear on next season. Let us know. Cool. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Podcific listeners. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next season. Bye. Bye. Aquarium of the Pacific is brought to you by Aquarium of the Pacific, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. In 2023, the aquarium celebrates 25 years of connecting millions of people worldwide to the beauty and wonder of our ocean planet. Head to aquariumofpacific.org to learn more about our 25th anniversary celebration. Keep up with the aquarium on social media at Aquarium Pacific on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. This podcast is produced by Aaron Lundy, Madeline Walden, and Scott Shaw. Our music is by Andrew Reitzma, and our podcast art is by Brandy Kenny. Special thanks to Cecile Fisher, Anissa Valles, and our audiovisual and education departments, and to all of our amazing podcast guests for taking time out of their day to talk about the important work that they do. Podcific wouldn't be possible without the support of the aquarium's donors, members, guests, and supporters. Thanks for listening.